It's been a long, cloudy winter here in the Pacific Northwest, but last week we were lucky enough to have three clear nights. And when I say three clear nights, realistically we had about two hours before the clouds would roll in. Still, that was enough time to photograph the Horsehead Nebula, and I really like how the final image turned out. In this video, I want to show you part of my workflow that might really help out your nebula photos. Essentially what we're going to be doing is removing the stars from the photo, and then increasing the structure of the image, and then finally adding the stars back in but subduing them a little bit. The end result is that we get a lot more texture from our background nebula without the bright stars in our face. Again, just to show you, we're gonna go from that roughly to that. If you wanna follow along with us today, you can use any of your nebula photos that you have. They should all work fairly well, or you can actually use the image I'm using if you head over to my Patreon. I've got a full 30 minute tutorial over on Patreon, including the TIFF file, so you can practice with us step by step. Today though, we're just gonna look at a chunk of that workflow that you can apply to any nebula photo you want. And to give you some idea of how the image started off, this was the raw data after it was stacked. It doesn't look like much, but with a few levels adjustments and curves, we got it to there, and towards the end, we got it all the way to there. That just shows you how important your editing is for astrophotography. Okay, I'm gonna get the image configured and then we'll be ready for the rest of our workflow. All right, I've gone through and reverted the image back about halfway through the workflow. This is where I went through and did a bunch of curves and levels to fix the contrast and the color cast and everything else. Again, I cover this on my Patreon page if you wanna see what I'm doing. But regardless of what you're photographing and what you're doing, you wanna have your image looking halfway decent and fix most of the problems to the point where you might be satisfied with your final photo at this point. If you're at that stage, you can hit Control shift alt e or Command-Shift-Option-E if you're on a Mac. If you hit those keys correctly, it should create a new layer. In this case, it's called Layer 3. This new layer is going to be the foundation for the rest of our edits today, so it's really important you create that right now. The next step is to go up to Filter, Camera Raw Filter. I want to show you a quick way to fix the grain in your photo one of the most annoying problems I see people have is color noise. And whether you're on a nice dedicated astro camera or a DSLR, this is usually a problem for all of us. To check if your image has a lot of color noise, just zoom all the way in. And you should notice kind of a rainbow pattern throughout the photo. That is the color noise that we're worried about. To fix it, just go to the detail tab, increase the color noise reduction slider to maybe 15 or 20 until the color noise disappears. Some of you guys, especially if you're on a DSLR and your sensor is getting really hot, you might have way more color noise that's still visible. If that's the case, then keep increasing the color noise reduction slider until it goes away. But hopefully it's not too big of an issue. While we're zoomed in here, you can increase the noise reduction slider as well. This will clean up the overall grain in the photo. I only want you to do the noise reduction slider though, if you're looking at a part of your photo that has some structure to it. In this case, the flame nebula or the horse head, because this is where you're going to notice the worst problems as you increase the noise reduction slider. In other words, the further I go, the less detail I'm going to have. So I need to find that sweet spot where I reduce the grain, but maintain the integrity of the image. And usually a value of 10 to 20 for your noise reduction slider works well. I don't think I mentioned this yet, but the photo we're looking at was captured with an ASI 294 camera, an Optolong L Enhance filter, I think. It's their dual band narrow band filter. And then the William Optics Space Cat telescope. All of this was captured from a fairly light polluted area and we shot from the back porch. And all of our neighbors have big bright spotlights turned on. It's like New Year's Eve here every day with all the lights everywhere. It gets pretty annoying, but either way, despite all those problems, I was still able to get a nice shot. And that's mainly thanks to the filter I'm using and the camera. Speaking of which, I will be making a video talking about my recommended camera gear for 2022. Getting back on track though, we fixed the grain in the photo. That was really all I wanted to do. I just want to make sure your image is nice and clean before we go any further. And then we'll hit OK. The next step in our workflow is to completely remove the stars because our goal is to enhance the clouds in the background. And we can't do that until all the stars are gone. There's a couple different applications you can use depending on what you prefer. One of the most popular is StarNet++. There's already a lot of videos on YouTube that explain how to do this, so I'd recommend you check out those. Just to show you, this is what I got out of StarNet++. It looks okay, 
The problem is the larger stars, and even the smaller ones, tend to leave behind a lot of artifacts. As I was editing this video, I realized that there was recently an update to Starnet++, the new version 2. And I'm happy to report version 2 is infinitely better than version 1. Just to show you very quickly here, this was the image out of version 1 with a lot of problems, but version 2 fixes almost every issue I had with the original. Here's another example up over here. We have this very bright star. Version 1 had a lot of artifacts that would have made me want to rip my hair out, but version 2, nice and clean. Later on in this video, I will be demoing the plugin called Star Exterminator from Russell Croman. But now that there's a version 2 for Starnet++, I'd highly recommend you get that. It's free, it's easy to use, and in the meantime, this will be a nice improvement over version 1. When you load up Star Exterminator, make sure you're running this on your top layer, in this case layer 3, and it should just come up with this window here, and then you can hit OK. It'll spend the next 5 minutes looking through your photo, removing all the stars, and then giving you the final image. And there's our starless photo out of Star Exterminator. I am noticing one problem though. If I increase the contrast, you might be able to see it better. But notice how there's kind of an ugly checkerboard pattern throughout the photo. Hopefully that gets fixed in an update because I would say it's a pretty serious problem when you can see clear squares in your photo. That's something I have not noticed with the free program Starnet++. Just be aware of that if you're thinking about buying Star Exterminator as of February 2022. Again, hopefully that gets fixed in an update. Either way though, if you're using Star Exterminator or Starnet++ or whatever you're going to do, now's the time to go through with your magnifying glass and look for any problems in the photo. We need to remove all these before we go any further. And I hate to tell you, but this can take anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour or more, depending on how fast you can go. And that's really the only downside with this workflow is that you have to spend the time to clean up the artifacts that were left behind. The easiest way to do this is usually the patch tool, which you'll find under the spot healing brush. With the patch tool, make sure you're on your layer here. Draw a little circle around it, click inside, drag down to a nearby area, let go, and then hit Control or Command D to deselect. I'd recommend you do this on a new layer though, that way you can compare your before and after. Let's stay organized here. We'll call layer three star exterminator. And then we'll duplicate that layer by right clicking on it. Duplicate layer. We'll call this cleanup. It's always a good idea to go through and name your layers. That way, if you come back to this tomorrow or a week from now, you'll know what layer does what. All right, so I'm gonna go through the image now, clean up all the little splotches that were left behind. It might take me a couple hours, but it's worth it in the end if you have a really good set of data. If you're noticing the same checkerboard pattern that I am, and you did Star Exterminator, then you might want to just use the free Starnet++ instead, because that one won't have the issues, and you would still do the same thing. Zoom in, use your patch tool to remove the problems, make sure you hit Control D, and then repeat as needed. I'm going to skip that part of the workflow today just to save us both some time, but I want to stress that you should always put in the effort to clean up your image before you go any further. Assuming your cleanup layer is looking good and you're ready to move on, now we're going to enhance those clouds in the background. For that, we'll hit Control shift alt e or if you're on a Mac, Command-Shift-Option-E, and that'll create a new layer. We'll call this High Pass. Then. With our new high pass layer, we'll go up to filter, other, high pass. The high pass filter really targets the nebula and it's kind of like a way to sharpen the image without actually sharpening it the old fashioned way. You're gonna have a radius slider and you can put in any value you want, but I'd recommend you start off small and then work your way up. In this case, I might just start with 10 pixels and the way I'm able to choose the value is I look at the photo and I see what looks kind of highlighted. In this case, the flame nebula and the horse head, it looks good to me. And then I'll hit OK with a value of 10 pixels. The filter needs one more addition before it's complete. And that is to change the blending mode from normal to either overlay or soft light usually. 
Soft light is noticeably smoother than overlay, so that's always my preferred option. But keep in mind, you could even do hard light, vivid light, or even linear light. As we go up from one to one, it really increases the effect of the filter. We're looking at linear light right now compared to soft light right there. See how much softer that is? In this case, I will just stick with the default soft light and that looks great. Let me show you what that did. If we zoom in, we have the horse head in the flame. Here it is before, it's pretty soft. And after, it stands out a lot better. That looks pretty good, but now I wanna target the clouds in the background. And the best way to do that is with another high pass layer. Let's do Control Shift Alt E again. We have another new layer. We'll rename it to High Pass 2. And then we can go back up to Filter, Other, High Pass. If we did a value of 10 before, maybe now we want to try 20 or 30. If I go up to 30, you can see that these other areas are being targeted a lot better now, and that might work well for us. A value of 30, we'll hit OK. Don't forget we need to change the blending mode from normal to soft light or even hard light or vivid light, whatever you think looks best for your image. Clearly, the linear light filter is way too strong, but if nothing else, it highlights any problems in our photo. For example, if I zoom in, I might start to realize that I missed a lot of little splotches throughout the image. If you notice a similar problem, you can either go back to your cleanup layer and fix them, or you can do it afterwards, whatever is easier for you. Either way, just look through the photo right now with the linear light and make sure there's no glaring problems. If things largely look good though, then change the blending mode to either overlay or soft light as those are the typical options. Here's our before and after for that new high pass filter. It's pretty subtle, but it definitely helps the image. If you're happy with both of your high pass layers, let's hit Control Shift Alt E again. This new layer, we're gonna call Structure. After you've renamed it to Structure, go up to Filter, Camera Raw Filter. And now we can adjust the Texture and Clarity sliders. Texture, this adds even more of like a high pass effect to your photo. Clarity, likewise, will increase the contrast in your image. I realize this looks really ugly right now. I'm just doing this to illustrate a point. And that is, if you didn't capture enough light for whatever nebula you're trying to photograph, whatever problems in terms of grain were in the photo are gonna be really accentuated at this point in the workflow. But one of the great things about astrophotography is that as long as you keep a similar composition, you can always go out tonight, next week, or next month, as long as the object's still there, and keep capturing data, and then include it with your original stack of data to add more light in. This image here was actually two nights of data combined. And I want you to be aware that you can always take multiple nights worth of data and lump it all together. For this particular photo, I probably would have wanted at least 10 hours of data to have it look somewhat clean. But let's bring this back down to a more reasonable amount because it does look pretty nasty. That looks better. And then we'll go down to the detail tab and clean up any noise reduction that we want. I'd recommend you zoom in, and then increase the noise reduction slider until you've smoothed out some of the grain. Don't go too far though, but just a little bit. And then we can hit okay. If I turn off the top three layers, we can see that our original photo is very soft and almost look like a painting, which is nice, but sometimes you want a little bit extra kick in the photo, which is why we did those two high pass filters and then that texture or clarity one on top. As I continue to look at the photo, I realized that my structure layer was a little bit too intense, and I can easily reduce that with the opacity slider, maybe bring it down to only 50 or 60%. Now it's not as strong. At this point in the workflow, we're ready to add back our stars, and then we're gonna reduce them a little bit. Let me show you what I mean. I'm gonna turn off all of the layers that we've done today so far, and go back to the original image with all of our stars intact. I should have actually done this at the start of the video, but I guess I messed up, not a big deal. I'm just gonna click on my top layer before we did anything today, and then hit Control Shift Alt E. I'll rename this new layer to stars, because that's really all we're gonna use it for, and then drag it to the very top. With my stars layer on top of everything we've done, I need to change the blending mode from normal to lighten, because all I want this to do is bring in the stars. 
Now that the stars layer is set to the light and blend mode, I can turn on all my eyeballs again, and our texture really starts to shine through in the photo that we spent the last little bit working on. Just to show you, here's before. We had all of our star reduction and everything looked great. And then we added in the stars as a new layer on top with the light and blend mode. This allowed us to retain the structure and texture of the clouds, but we added in the stars so it didn't look as unnatural. The final step in our workflow today is to reduce the stars so they're not as bright. For that, we'll hit Control Shift Alt E again. You can rename this new layer to Star Reduction. Now we'll do our normal star reduction workflow in Photoshop. Our goal is to select just the stars, that way we can reduce their brightness. And the easiest way to do that is to go up to Select, Color Range. When the color range window opens up, make sure you're choosing highlights from the drop down menu. By default, it'll probably be sample colors. When you put it to highlights though, you can adjust the fuzziness and the range sliders until you selected the stars, but not the nebula. If you select too much nebula, it's gonna cause problems for us later on. So try to find that sweet spot if it's possible. If you're not seeing anything on your full screen preview, make sure the selection preview here is set to grayscale and that'll fix it. That looks good to me, so I'll hit okay. The only issue I can see is that part of the flame nebula got selected and I didn't mean it to. That's a very easy fix if we grab our lasso tool, hold down the alt or option key, and then draw circles around the problem areas that I didn't mean to include. And just that easy, we've got it all taken care of. Now, we're gonna zoom in anywhere in the photo, look at the stars, and say, you know, this little dotted line didn't quite fill up the entire star. I need to make that a little bit larger. The way to do that is select, modify, expand. You can expand this by two, three, four, five pixels, whatever is gonna work best for your particular setup. Generally, three is a good starting place. This is really what you're trying to see, is that the stars were completely surrounded by the dotted lines. Finally, we need to feather the selection with Select, Modify, Feather. The feathering amount is usually half of what you've just done. In this case, that would be 1.5. And then zoom into your nebula, where you have bright stars on the nebula. I'm noticing that I still have a few areas that need cleaned up with the lasso tool. Now would be a good time to do that, because I only want my stars selected, nothing else. Okay, that solved that problem. And then we'll go up to Filter, Other, Minimum. Remember, we're minimizing the brightness of the stars. The radius for your minimum just depends on the image. Hopefully you've zoomed in to an area where you have bright stars against your nebula because that's where you'll notice any problems. A radius can be anywhere from one to three or four pixels, just depending on your gear. For me, I think three is gonna work really well today. So we'll go with three. And then you can hit Control or Command D to deselect. I wanna scan through the photo and make sure there's no ugly dark halos around the stars or anything like that. If you're noticing a lot of ugly looking issues, then go up to your history tab, click above the minimum, so you've undone it, and then do it with a different value. So maybe if three was too much, filter, other, minimum. If three was too much, you could put it to maybe two this time. The lower the value, the less artifacts you'll have, but also the stars won't be as dim. So there's that kind of trade off right there. I think two will be a sweet spot though, because three had a few issues. We can hit Control D again, zoom out, and there's our final image. If I turn on and off the star reduction layer, we can see that before the stars were still too bright and distracting, but after we've really toned them down and that allows our structure adjustments to really stand out. Because without those, the image was just a little too soft. And just to show you, here's a before, and after of what we've done today. It's pretty subtle, I'll admit, but at the same time, I think it had a nice effect to the photo. We've enhanced the dust clouds in the background, 
and we brought down the brightness of the stars. Both really good things. And that's all I've got for you today. I hope you enjoyed the video. You know, it wasn't anything groundbreaking, but I still think it's a fun way to alter your images and take them up just a little bit better. If you want to learn even more, I do have a bunch of content on my Patreon page for just 10 bucks a month. And of course, I still have the courses on my website, which are very detailed, 15, 20 hours worth of content that takes you through the entire process from setting up your camera to shooting the objects, and then of course, editing your photos. 